I'm extremely glad, glad that we pray to the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've had two almost entirely sleepless nights staying in a student residence in Fordham. So I'm in a slightly confused state. I'm reminded of the uh, British cabinet minister who said that he, he dreamt that he was addressing the House of Commons and woke up to find that he was doing so. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be, be back here in my alma mater, one of my alma maters, um, Ohio Dominican. And I was delighted to see that you've been recognized, we've been recognized, as being one of the best universities in the Midwest. And I hope that the Dominican Panthers continue to strike terror in the hearts of all their opponents. When I, when I look around uh, the hall, because I see lots of people that I know, lots of people who are old friends. I also see people that I've never met, and, and I would love to have met you beforehand, discovered what it is that uh, concerns you, what are your hopes, and what are your fears. You know, as young friars, we were always taught that you must listen before you preach. The first act of preaching is to listen. So I always feel a little bit impertinent just turning up here and talking without having first heard you. But it reminds me of a story which I often repeat, all my sisters will know this, about a, one of my brethren who gave a lecture in Chicago. And when he sat down, the applause was a little bit tepid. And so he said to the man beside him, he said, I hope it wasn't that bad, was it? And the man said, oh, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I just blame whoever asked you to come and speak in the first place. <laughs> I want to talk uh, this afternoon about how we engage the imagination of our contemporaries. When I was a, a young friar, uh, there was a very popular song by John Lennon, one of the Beatles. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. Now, in America, you still remain a much more religious country than my own, Western Europe. But increasingly, there are people who imagine there's no heaven. How, how can we reach them? How can we touch their imagination? I went to a debate a few months ago in Oxford, attended by the university, a debate between uh, Ronald Dawkins, the aggressive atheist. I had to be use, careful about using that term. Once when I used it in a, in a lecture, I got a, a letter from somebody who said, how dare you call us atheists aggressive, you disgusting, miserable little whip. That's before she became aggressive. <laughs> so we had this debate between uh, Richard Dawkins and Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it was good and enjoyable, but it didn't ever quite take off for some reason. I thought that Rowan Williams, the Archbishop, he was able to engage with Dawkins' scientific imagination. In fact, there was almost nothing that Dawkins said that any Christian would want to disagree with. The difficulty was the other way around. That Dawkins was unable to enter in any way the Christian imagination of the Archbishop. At the end, Rowan made some wonderful statements, trying to conjure up how we look at the world with gratitude. Why is there anything rather than nothing? 
something of the infinite mystery of love. But Dawkins simply couldn't get it. You know, it was like a, a musician, for somebody. It's like somebody who's got no musical sense, being unable to make any sense of Bartok. In fact, Richard Dawkins reminded me of my mother. For the only time in my life, I'm a great fan of a Korean Dominican painter called Kim En Yong. And in my office in Rome, I had this fantastic, amazing painting, a great white background covered with, with dramatic colors, entirely abstract. And every morning I'd look at it and it would refresh me. And I took my mother and I said, isn't it amazing? And she looked at it coolly. And she said, my dear, it looks a bit like your habit after an exceptionally messy breakfast. <laughs> How do we touch the imagination of our contemporaries? Now, how many of you have seen an extraordinary film, the best film I've seen for years, called Of Gods and Men? Quite a lot. Uh, I'd hope for a little more, but maybe we could just glance at the trailer. Maybe I'll tell you about it, and then we can look at the trailer for just a couple of minutes. It's a film about a community of a small community of about eight or ten of them, Cistercian monks, Trappists, who lived in Algeria in the 1990s. They lived in a Muslim village, deeply embedded. They loved and they were loved. But they find themselves caught up in a rising tide of violence. There's the violence of the Islamist terrorists who are encroaching ever more on their lives. And there's the violence of the army's response. And so the question that they have to face is will they stay or will they go? Finally, they arrive at a consensus to stay. And then on the 21st of May, 1996, all of them, bar two by chance, are taken away in the night and beheaded. Almost every word in this film is a quotation either from their letters or their diaries. Now let's hit the button and see what happens. Moi, je propose que chacun de nous se prononce sur un départ possible. Jean-Pierre Il faut rester. Depuis quand on obéit aux armes Paul Je pense qu'il faut partir. Progressivement. Célestin Je suis malade, je veux partir. Luc Partir, c'est mourir. Je reste. Michel Personne ne m'attend nulle part. Je reste. À m'aider Je ne sais pas encore. Il faut réfléchir et prier ensemble. Moi, je pense qu'il faut partir. Et toi, Christian Je suis d'accord avec Amédée, je trouve qu'il est prématuré de décider. I went to see this film in Oxford 
with a friend of mine who's um, an atheist. Well, on a good day, I suppose he's an agnostic. And the cinema was, was filled with uh, university faculty and, and students. Uh, many of them, I happen to know, uh, weren't Christian. And when we got to the end, nobody wanted to leave. I, I don't know whether you ever had that experience where you go to the cinema and you hang on the last credits. Who did the hair? Who was the best boy? Nobody wants to go. I suppose I was especially moved because I'd been to Algeria about four weeks after their murder. Uh, one of the local bishops, Pierre Clavery, was a Dominican, and he'd been receiving death threats. So obviously we had to, to show Pierre our solidarity. Every day when he drove around the diocese, he would telephone to see where was less dangerous because they were looking out for him. They wanted to catch him in an ambush. And then about a month after I left, uh, he too was assassinated. One day, he got back to his house. But once he'd had a, a chauffeur, a driver, a young Muslim called Mohammed, and they were waiting for him, and they put dynamite into the wall of the house and detonated it. And he was completely pulverized. But it touched everybody there. In fact, the fascinating thing is that the director, the man who decided to make this film, was not himself a Christian. But when he heard the story, he was so captivated that he just had to tell it. So, what I want to ask is why is it so powerful and what does that say about how we may share our faith with our contemporaries? I think the first thing is because these monks are just particular people, they're ordinary. You know, they're not superstars, they're not heroes. They're ordinary people like you and me. I was very irritated passing a Quaker prayer house the other day when it said, even an ordinary person like you can make a difference. I thought, how does he know that I'm ordinary? These monks are just the sort of people we meet every day. Uh, of course, they're actors, but they, they're so convincing that you'd never believe it. I mean, I've been a religious for almost 50 years. And I can spot a pseudo-monk in a nanosecond. There's a wonderful scene where Luke, you saw old Luke, who's the doctor, the oldest member of the community, he's washing up with Christoph, the youngest. And they have a bit of an argument. Christoph is in a bad mood. And finally he tells Luke to F off. I thought, oh, there's somebody who knows something about religious life. Christians believe, paradoxically, that we can discover the ultimate human destiny, the reason for the whole of creation, in a particular man, a Jew who was born in an unimportant little town on the edge of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. And I think saints have always touched us because they are particular people. They are becoming the people that God created them to be. Our society is very tempted by prefabricated identities, whether it's celebrity or ones that are created by the marketplace. Douglas Google worked for Douglas Edwards worked for Google for many years. He said, everything I owned for a while had the Google logo. Umbrellas, towels, t-shirts, boxer shorts. It was on every 
pen I picked up and every piece of paper. Google took over my sense of who I am. As you know, famously, we say that celebrities are famous for being famous. And in this world of insecure identity, where we're wondering who we are, a lot of people would like to cling, if you want, to a little bit of the reality of those celebrities. They must be real because you see them on television. And if we could be a little bit like them, and dress like them as I do, obviously, today, then we might catch a little bit of their reality. But that's an illusion. Holiness is the labor of being born as the person God created you to be. Iris Murdoch, a philosopher and novelist, wrote in her novel, Nuns and Soldiers, our vices are general dull, the ordinary mud, and even when they're extreme, they're all the same. Only in our virtues are we original. Vices are general. Virtues are particular. Why, why do we take refuge sometimes in these pseudo-identities, these prefabricated identities? How is it that saints do not? I think it's because they take the vast risk of believing that they can be loved as they are. They don't need to create some artificial facade that will attract admiration and love. So if we are to engage people, then we have to be the human beings that we are. Brad Pitt and I are frequently confused but I'm not him. Once when I was signing books at a, a, a bookshop in Paris, I was delighted to see that there were hundreds of people queuing up to have their books signed. And I was a bit puzzled until I heard somebody say, C'est l'oncle de Harry Potter. It is the uncle of Harry Potter. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe. Alas, it isn't true. I didn't say anything until they'd bought all the books, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Thomas Aquinas. I'm not St. Dominic. I'm just me, as these monks were. Most religion is boring because it's abstract. Mike Jagger, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, said, you don't want to talk and walk about Jesus. You just want to see his face. Or Madonna. I'm sure you've all heard of crazy Madonna. Jesus Christ, will you look at me? Don't know who I'm supposed to be. Or Joan Osborne has a song called, What if God were one of us? What if God were one of us? Just a slob like one of us just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home. And I think with in these monks, we see, if you want, love incarnate, flesh and blood, not abstract. And it's worth asking, when have you ever had that experience of encountering, if you want, Love made flesh and blood. The intimacy of God, who's close, Emmanuel, God with us. I'll just share one example, and, and maybe at the end you might be able to think of some that you'd like to share with us. A few months after the murder of the monks and uh, of our brother, Pierre Clavery, I was in Paris for the Christmas vigil. And one of our brethren, Pedro Meca, who's a Spanish Dominican, he lives on the pavements of Paris. He has a ministry to the tramps, the Danites. 
he sleeps on the pavements. Perhaps not so much now, he's got a bit older. Every week he'd go back to the community and he'd have a meal with the brethren and have a shower. Well, have the shower before the meal. And every Christmas he would hold the vigil for the down and outs, the homeless. They would erect an enormous tent in the center of Paris for a thousand people. Mass was celebrated on a cardboard box for all the people who live in cardboard boxes. It was all slightly feverish. I think the celebrations started a bit beforehand. When they brought up the bottle of wine at the offertory procession and removed the cork, you know, they, everybody cheered. But it was a moment of grace. It was a moment when you felt the barriers between human beings collapsing. It was a moment when you said, God is here. God is present among us. And I think a second reason, but closely related, as to why these monks move us so much, is that we see each of them taking that journey of faith. In the trailer, thank you, Laura, for, for just finding the trailer for us. In the trailer, you saw them having a discussion, should they go or should they stay? The prior, Christian de Clerget, believed from the beginning that they had to stay. But his brethren resisted this in being imposed. One of them said, we didn't elect you to take decisions for us. He'd have made a good Dominican. Each of them has to take their time to arrive at the decision that we know, in theory, we know, is right. They have to stay. One of the villagers said, we are the birds that rest on the branches and you are the branches. And so they move ineluctably towards that final night when there will be the knock on the door and they will be led away into the mountains, into the night. And I think we identify with these monks because they have to walk the walk. They have to make their way each of them, separately and together, discovering in our own individual hearts, but as a community, why they must stay. Finally, one will stay because he said, I love Algeria. Another will stay because he believes the gospel requires it. Another says, well, what is there for me back at home? So we need were touched, I think, by their weakness and by their fear. They're afraid. Anybody who's been in that sort of situation is afraid. Sometimes Christians can put us off because they speak with such terrifying conviction. An American Dominican called William Hill said, God cannot do without are stammering words. So, when Jesus meets people, do you know, very often the first thing he does is he asks them a question. He says to them, the first words of Jesus in John's Gospel are what you seek. The first words of Jesus after the resurrection to Mary Magdalene are why are you weeping? First words then to Peter are, do you love me more than those others? And the very last words in the whole gospel of Je are, are, are Jesus talking about the beloved disciple. If he remains until I come, what's that to you? Jesus questions. And these questions draw us along the path. They lure us onwards. They invite us to take the next step. I think each of us 
is like those monks responding to the interrogation of the gospel, step by step, being brought to conviction and illumination. That's why the transmission of faith is never just repeating what somebody else has said. You've got to make your journey. Christian doctrine doesn't tell you all the answers. It doesn't give you a nice coherent theory that you can just repeat. That's what heresy does. Heresy wraps it all up. What Christian doctrine does is it invites you to move one step nearer the mystery, which is beyond all words. As St. Gregory of Nyssa said, going from beginning to beginning to beginning. I, th- I think it's like lighting beacons. You know, in England, in the Middle Ages, before they had cell phones, if you want to transmit the news, you did it by lighting a beacon. And somebody on a hill far away would see the light, and they'd light their beacon. And so be carried from beacon to beacon. In Boston, I know they got Beacon Hill which no doubt transmitted the good news that the British were right. (laughs) Do you have any Beacon Hills in Columbus? Each of us, in a sense, lights our own fire. The gospel as it's refracted through our own humanity. Let me give you a, a little example. It's terribly oversimplified, and it's embarrassing because I have a little role to play in it. You have the last words of Jesus on the cross in all the Gospels. Well, in the 17th century Lima, there was a terrible earthquake, uh, great suffering, especially among the indigenous people. And to try to cast some light of the Gospel to light a little beacon, the Jesuits gathered these seven last words into uh, in, into a, a new devotion under the light of the Ignatian spirituality. And that, in a sense, made a new light in a time of new suffering. A hundred years later or so, in 1785, Haydn was asked to put them to music. The Good Friday in Cadiz Cathedral. So, they passed through the spectrum of his own creativity, his own musical genius. They came alive in a new way through him. In 1993, I had to fly back from Jerusalem in a hurry because my father was dying. And I went to see him in hospital about three days before he finally died. And I said to him, Pa, is there anything that I can do? And he said, bring me my Walkman. I don't suppose we got Walkman any longer, but I had Walkman in those days. He said, bring me my Walkman. I want to listen to Haydn's seven last words. And Mozart's record. I was deeply moved because what he was doing, he was facing death, annihilation, with music, song. I'll come back to that at the very end. In 2002, I was asked to go and preach at Seattle Cathedral on Good Friday with the seven last words. And I was inspired by my father's way of facing death with music, as he was inspired by Haydn, as he was inspired by the Jesuits who were inspired by the gospel. And that helped me to to meditate upon these words, which ended up as a little book called Seven Last Words. Buy it. You don't have to read it. I always have to promote sales, otherwise my bursar will hate me. And then a few months ago, I was, uh, no, gosh, it's time's passing. 18 months ago, I was contacted 
by a head teacher from the west of England. And she'd read my little book, and she wanted her school to put it to music. And in fact, she gathered four schools, and they had the most amazing musical with the lyrics largely composed by the kids. I couldn't understand a word of them. But they used some of my texts, and at Plymouth Cathedral, a Catholic cathedral, we had this amazing gathering, 400 kids in the choir. There's a CD out. So then it passed through their creativity, their own fresh, different way of understanding the mystery. So in a sense, whenever you transmit the gospel, your hearers will make their own sense of it. A new sense, something that you would not have anticipated. In Isaiah, God says, Behold, I make all things new. You know, in many parts of the church, including the United States of America, you get tensions between generations. And sometimes, you know, tired old liberals like myself Say, oh, the young are undoing everything we've done. You know, they've been all more conservative. I think that that's not a useful way of looking at it. But I also believe that if you transmit the gospel, you must accept that people will interpret it differently. And you have to discover the imaginative journey that they are making. You have to open your heart to the sense, their sense of the adventure. Even if superficial, it contradicts your own. Thirdly, I think that the film moves us because it tells us of a very strange paradoxical story, which is the drama, The Victory of Nonviolence. When you, you watch these old monks stumbling up the mountain, helping each other with tremendous tenderness and gentleness, you might think that they're all going to be annihilated, that they have been defeated. But I bet you, I bet my bottom dollar, as we say in England, that nobody in the cinema saw it as defeat. It was a paradoxical victory. And we saw in their tenderness, their gentleness, a love which cannot be defeated. That's the drama that touches our imagination. And like Viola in Twelfth Night, we want to cry out, prove true imagination, oh prove true. Every society needs its story of the victory of goodness. Otherwise, our sufferings are meaningless and we might as well despair. Often in the Old Testament, it takes the form of the bad, the rich, bad people getting squashed. They've had their go. They're going to get a terrible surprise. And we will get our reward. But the story of the New Testament is the strange story of the man who forgives on the cross, forgives his enemies, refuses violence, and rises on the third day. I don't think any society ever permanently gets that. It's so paradoxical. So it's a truth that we win and we lose. If you, if you look at our society, generally we are still living by the pre-Christian story. The good must smash the bad. You know, most films lead up to the final combat and we see the good win. And the world's okay for a few hours until we have to find another bad person to crush. And if we're lucky, it takes the form of a court case and a brilliant lawyer will snatch victory at the last minute. As Jane Malcolm, the American crime reporter, said, 
hey, we got the killer, don't worry, you can go to the playground, nothing is going to happen. More often, it's about how the good kill. I went to two films uh, on two consecutive nights in Oxford. One was Avatar, and the other was Sherlock Holmes. And they're as different as you can imagine. Avatar, I'm sure most of you have seen, it's about eight foot tall blue Californians uh, living on a future planet. And Sherlock Holmes, you see our great British detective sorting out crime at the end of the 19th century but they end in an identical way pretty well, which is the shootout at the OK Corral. It's John Wayne getting his man. I was really so saddened that the code name for the assassination of Osama bin Laden was Geronimo, a Native American. We still haven't got it. I don't think any society gets it permanently. Every society glimpses in rare moments that it is the non-violent who have the final victory. I just pray that the deaths of those kids at Sandy Hook may help us for a conversion of heart. Now, this strange Belief in the victory of nonviolence can only be communicated dramatically. We'll never touch the imagination of our contemporaries if we try to market Christianity as some sort of nice moral values or an attractive lifestyle option or an innocuous spirituality, light a few candles and add a touch of Myers-Briggs psychology. It's about being caught up in the greatest drama that there could ever be, which is the drama of death and resurrection. And we have to give our young people the best, you know, which is to lay out this extraordinary, wonderful, costly story. We owe them the best. So I'm reminded of one of my New York brethren who had a bit of a problem with alcohol. He went to see the doctor. And the doctor said, Well, Father, the very best thing that you could do is to give up drinking altogether. And he replied, Doctor, I am not worthy of the very best. <laughs> What's the second best? You can't offer Christianity on a plate, you know? In a few simple, literal statements. When you go around London, I expect it's maybe the same here in Columbus, you see these big signs out of the church, outside churches. God is love. Jesus died to save you from your sins. The one I always like is the one that says, would you prefer to watch with the wise virgins or to sleep with the foolish ones? <laughs> But normally, I don't think that these flat statements actually mean anything to anybody unless you already believe them. You have to discover their truth dramatically. I went to um, the Institut Catholique to give a retreat uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. That's where Christian de Clerget was a young seminarian never dreaming the direction that his life would take. And I went to spend some time in his little cell. And on the wall, they had his last testimony. This is what he wrote a few days, weeks before he died. And particularly moving are the words that he addresses to the person who he knows will come to kill him. What he wrote was that if it should happen one day, and it could be today, that I become the victim of terrorism, 
which now seems ready to encompass all foreigners in Algeria. I would like my community, my family, my church to remember that my life was given to God, to this country. To accept that the one master of all life was not a stranger to this brutal departure. For this life lost, totally mine and totally theirs, I thank God, who seems to have wished it entirely for the sake of that joy in and spite of everything. And now he addresses the person he expects will kill him. And you too, my last minute friend, who will not know what you are doing. Yes, for you too, I say this. Thank you. Adieu. To commend you to this God in whose face I see yours. And may we find each other happy good thieves in paradise. If it feet please the God and Father of us both. Amen. Inshallah. Now it's unlikely that many of us will have to die for our faith. Most of us will die in our beds. But it's salutary to remember that the typical Christian witness is martyrdom. And that there were more martyrs in the 20th century than in all the other centuries put together. One person who, who lives this risk every day, I can't resist referring to, Henri Burin de Rosier, French Dominican lawyer, who's fighting against uh, slavery in Brazil, uh, these great estates in Brazil where hundreds of people are held slaves. They try to escape their kill. Henri takes them to court, much to the anger of the landowners. One of them offered $30,000 for anybody who would kill him. Henri phoned me and told me that he was sad. He'd been devalued. He'd just gone down to $20,000. Well, I went to stay with him, and he said, I didn't realize that he put me up to, to stay in his room. <laughs> he told me the next day he would have been very embarrassed if I'd been murdered instead of him. <laughs> but many of us will have to witness in some way. Let me give you, sorry, I'm going on longer than I thought, but Ronald is, is forgiving person I can see has already forgiven me once today. Uh, you may, different forms of martyrdom we will have to face. Let me give you two examples that I came across in the last week. Uh, a young Boston priest came to see me who is uh, under vast pressure from vicious blogs uh, because um, he had a mass which was especially open to gay people. And he was almost slaughtered for it. Deeply depressed by the vicious abuse that he received. Thanks be to God, the cardinal stood by him and supported him. But he felt wiped out. And now apparently on the other side, but in fact on the same side, uh, a, a member of parliament, a British member of parliament, texts me the other night. And she's done a great deal of work for, for gay people, but she happened to believe that gay marriage was a mistake. She voted against it. And uh, she has received the similar treatment. She had to, she's actually had to cut off all contact with the outside world because of the vicious abuse. It's getting time to finish. So one last brief word. I think the film finally touches us because it's beautiful. Beauty is, touches the imagination more than words, which is why I should shut up. There's an incredibly powerful scene where the monks are in the chapel trying to sing Vespers. 
And hovering over the little chapel is a helicopter. And it's dull, menacing, deadly sound, violent sound, drowns, all tries to drown their singing. But they cling together and they sing, O Père des Lumières, O Father of Lights. That's what we offer in the face of destruction, is beauty. There was a young priest in uh, Krakow called Karol Wojtyla. And when Cardinal Wojcicki was looking for an auxiliary bishop in Krakow, he had Karol Wojtyla, later known as John Paul II, at the bottom of his list. He said, he's a poet. I don't want a poet to fight the communists. And the communists really wanted him to be named for the same reason. But this young Polish priest believed in what he called the theater of resistance, or the poetry of resistance. He believed the beauty is what would bring communism tumbling down. And he was right. It's beauty that has the triumph. And all during the life of the church, we flourished when we've dare engaged with the greatest, the most creative people. Whether it's Giotto, Fra Angelico, one of our brothers in the 14th century, you know, the Renaissance, awkward, difficult people like Caravaggio, Michelangelo, who did all sorts of scandalous things, you know. But the church was unafraid to work with them. Or the beginning of the 20th century, the French Dominicans, working with people like Matisse, and Braque, Le Corbusier, when people said, they're not Christians, they said, well, okay, you know, so what? Work with them. If God has given them creativity, then they must be our partners. And the director of this film, as I said, uh, wasn't a Christian. Some of the actors became Christians, returned to Christianity because of the film. So we have to be courageous. I think we have to have the courage to engage with the most creative people, whether it's the filmmakers, the blog makers, you know, the novelists, and to recognize in their talent ways of touching people's imagination. Thank you very much. 